We uh, announced last week that we're going to start, we're going to go on a journey through the book of Romans because this is such a special book. Uh, before I start, I'd like to invite the Usher to help me distribute the booklets prepared by Pastor Dennis. Usher, please go ahead. receive your booklets, write your name on it. This is uh, prepared with all the hard books uh, by Pastor Lenny's. And you believe that this book, Romans, will be such a great blessing to all of you. The reason why we say that because the book Romans has preceded every single great revival that the church has experienced throughout our church history. Every time when some individuals read the book of Romans, they felt the call and some great men will rise and respond to the call of God and they bring forth great revivals. The very Protestant Reformations by Martin Luther, he was so convinced by this one scripture from the book of Romans that he will rise and he changed just history because of that. Now, Romans, they are interesting track. We went through the book of Acts in the past and we also uh, gone through the uh, book of Philippines. We all know that Paul, throughout his ministry, he always has a desire to go to Rome. However, his plan was always frustrated because it was not God's will. And these Romans basically is a letter to the Roman to the church in Rome. So it's called Romans. It is written by Paul in Corinth. Now, for some of us that are not aware of uh, 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 significant uh, lay, uh, leaders, female leaders in our church, this book happened to have a view of that. Number one, if you know a friend named Phoebe and the parents are Christian, it's very likely that the parents named the daughters after these deacons from Corinth because Phoebe is a person that delivered the letters written by Paul to the church in Rome. So Phoebe, how many of you know a, a friend named Phoebe? Let me see your hand. Now you know. She is the UPS person for Paul. Okay. Now you know. Now another business woman that you know of is called, we all know, who is it? Priscilla, right? This is a couple, one of the couple. Aquila and Priscilla. And they are panickers, they are business people, they are close associated with Paul. Now Priscilla and Aquila is also a, cup, a Jewish couple of Christians that was uh, 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 dispelled from Rome. The reason because uh, during a time Caesar Claudius was so upset with Christians in Rome because in Rome, under Roman Empire, they will tolerate you if you worship many, many, many gods. Romans are influenced heavily by the Greek. They believe in many gods. So they can tolerate you if your practice, if your religious uh, practice is you worship many things, including Caesar, they are fine with that. However, it is during the time of Caesar Claudius that he noticed there's a sect among the Jewish people that rise and they worship only one God. It is because of a so this upset with them that he cast them out from the city of Rome. And that's how Priscilla and Aquila ended up in Corinth and they met with Paul and became the close associate with Paul. We all know that at the end of Paul's ministry, he ended up in Rome under what circumstances? If some of you still remember, he was under house arrest, right? Under who? Actually, I don't remember the name two hours. Uh, this is a true question, it's not a true question. 
Felix, I believe the governor, and then and, and another one that we place in. We talk about this in the book of Acts. So, at the end of Paul's ministry, he actually died in Rome. But this letter is the letter that is written by Paul from Corinth to the church in Rome. To understand Romans, this book, why is it so special, we first need to understand Romans. What is the context? What is the background there? Now, you, I see that I put out a picture there. If you look at Romans, Romans, they are actually famous for many things. But if you truly study history, you will realize that actually Romans, they are innovative. They are good in improving something that is already out. So we call it Romans, they are like today's apples. Right? For some of you, the young generation, millennial, you have no idea. Apples, for your information, never invented iPod. I mean, uh, music players. All right. and iPod is Apple's product. They never invented music player. They never invented uh, mobile phones. They never invented tablets, computers. However, when we talk about tablets, computers, talk about music players, talk about mobile phones, quickly you will think about who? iPhone, iPod, iPad. I, iPhone, I, iPod, I think they already uh, stopped uh, making them something like that. For your information, I do not use Apple's product, so forgive me. But anyway, come back to Romans. So, Romans, so many things that they are famous for, they never really, they are not the one that invented it, they just improved on it. So, what does the Romans improve on? If you go to Rome nowadays, what is one thing that you will go, one place that you go and visit? Number one, Colosseum. the Colosseums, right? Yes. yes. To see two gladiators beating up each other, right? <laughs> That's what Colosseum is famous for, famous for uh, performance for a large audience, uh, performance before Caesars, and that includes the barriers between the uh, gladiator. And what are the things that you will notice in Rome? Romans are famous for making Actually, they are famous for making something that we take it for granted every day. Roads. Roads. Very good. Who say that? Freddy. Jordan. Freddy. Freddy. <laughs> Very good. They are famous for making roads. I found some uh, pictures very interestingly. This is a post by some frustrated uh, Australian, right? You can see. One year old roads built by the Australian. You see it full of potholes and stuff. And then next to it, it's a 2,000 year old road built by Romans, still with pepper stone and everything in good shape. Another one, I'm not sure what area it is, this is 2 years old modern roads. Again, compared to 2,000 year old Romans roads. Romans are famous for making, not just road, but making good quality roads. You see, in the 5th century, King Darius, Darius. King Darius is the king, if you remember, who is it? The king that Daniel served under, right? In the Persian Empire. He is the one that first got the idea of making a road. And he decreed that for the construction of the royal road, that stretches 1600 miles. However, when you build a road, it is not all straight and it is not all paved with good and, and durable materials. You know? so, the Romans got the ideas from a uh, uh, king, you know, Darius, and they built roads. And Romans, at one point, they had 29 military highways connecting to the capitals, with 130 provinces connected by 370 roads. Something that people today would take it for granted because. You know, as long as you step outside, you can see roads and highway, right? But back then, it is something that is unheard of. Roman Empire, in fact, becomes so powerful because they have such a well-built uh, infrastructure that enable uh, a merch uh, was it, a merchandise to flow freely, 
uh, covers ideas. That's why Rome is such a special place. Another special thing that the Romans built is what? That they still use it up until today. If you go to Rome, one of the things that you will go and visit is to see what? Their aqueducts. That is to bring the water into the city. It is so well built that it is still in use in Rome nowadays. So Rome, the Romans, they are very, very good in improving on ideas because who first think of aqueducts? If you study the culture of Egypt, you will know that Egyptians start building it. They, they have it, you know, but they didn't build it well. Again, Rome improved on it. And they are just like Apple. Whatever they do, they became very, very successful. However, due to this innovative skill that they have, that is one thing they also take on that impact the culture of the Romans. Guess what? They improved on Greek mythologies. Do you know that Zeus? Right, some of you high schooler, you might have to study Greek mythology, right? You know the sun god Zeus, right? And guess what? Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me, I don't study Greek mythology. Uh, yes, okay, good. So Zeus, they have a Roman equivalent. It's called Juniper, right? And then if you study Greek mythologies, every single uh, a mystical of uh, figures from Greek mythologies that have it in the Roman culture. In fact, they improve on it. Why do I bring in this point? This is the very reason that the Romans, because they worship so many gods, they are so good in doing that, in building temples, that the church, when the Jewish people that lived there became Christians, the faith become mixed with the local culture of the Roman people. So when you study the book of Romans, one part of the scriptures, Paul has to address a lot of gray area in terms of practice, in terms of uh, consuming food that are uh, offered to idols. Okay? And also because of this background, as Paul writes Romans, this letter has become such a systematic, good uh, uh, a theology book that it becomes so effective. And that's the reason why when people study Romans, it changes. It changes the whole worldview about our life. Paul needs to address all this issue from the beginning of sins, how sins enter the world, how the grace of God save us and how we're going to live our life as a Christian. All these points are addressed in the book of Romans. And that's why Romans is such an important book in the Bible. Now if you study the Bible, you know that all Bibles, all the books, they are all God's book. Amen, brothers and sisters? But God purposed them for different reasons. For example, young people, you daily talk about God's courtship, right? What is a good book to read? Songs of Solomon, right? Some of the uh, some of the scripture can be quite graphic, but it talk about you know God create sexual relationship between a husband and a wife, which is which is a good thing. I like to talk about that to young people because I always say that you rather hear from me than you hear it from internet, right, or social media, or right, and get all the wrong message. Each book of the Bible serves its purpose. What about God's sovereignty over suffering? There are no other book that can touch on this topic as well as the book of, what book? Job, right? And I give you some examples of the famous, uh, the, the, my favorite words from this book. For example, from the book of Job, talk about God's sovereignty over suffering. From verse chapter 1, verse 21, it says, Naked I came from my mother's wounds, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, 
and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Talking about God's sovereignty. And out of these words, we all know one very popular worship song, right? Where is it? Come on, you guys sing it all the time. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That is based on this scripture. He gave and take away. You hear that? Right. God gave and God take away. Talk about God's sovereignty. What about the book of Philippines that we just went through? We all know that this is a prison letter because Paul writes to the uh, church in Philippines, uh, Philippi, out of uh, prisons. And it's talking about how to rejoice always, even in times of suffering. And the, my favorite words out of that book, Philippines chapter 4 and 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Amen, brother and sister? Now see, I can easily give you my favorite words from this book. However, when I was preparing Romans, then I realized um, one thing. That there are so many words that I like, that I memorize, is from the book of Romans. I cannot actually give you one. Now this is what Martin Luther say about the book of Romans. He said, Romans is really the chief part of the New Testament. When you study the New Testament, according to Martin Luther, that's the number one book that you study. According to John Calvin, if we have gained a true understanding of these epistles, we have an open door to all the most profound treasures of the scripture. What does the book of Romans talk about? Today, I'm only going to touch on introductions to stir your interest for, for this book. Why this book is so great. You see, Book of Romans covers all of this. The breath of God, grace, the plans of God for our life, and the will of God. So for the next 13 weeks, we believe we will take on a great journey. We believe that your faith can be renewed. You can once again take inventory of your faith as you go through the book of Romans, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. This is a wonderful letter of the whole truth of humans fallen nature, of sins, of our sins against our creators. And yet, because God loved us, and God sent His Son for His atoning works on the cross, that we have God's grace nowadays that we can go back to God. You see, you can study Romans and come away totally changed. There are many, many great men of God that are impacted because they study Romans. In AD 386, a 32 years old North African teachers of literature. Some of you have heard of it because Pastor Lenny talked about this person all the time. This is one of the greatest church father for Western Christianity. You want to guess the name? Some of you? I will tell you who this person is, alright? I'm going to tell you what happened to him. So at one point, as he was spending time in the land, he was crying in the garden. This is a true story. And then he hear some neighbors Young kids were playing a game and they were singing songs. He said, take up and read, take up and read. And then he looked to his side and there lay the book of Romans. And pick it up and he reads. This man was crying at that time. He was sorrowing and weeping because he knew that his life was not right before God. Even though he was a successful professor. And yet, something telling him that his life is not going in the right direction because his mother is a faithful Christian. And at that point, he himself was having an affair and living with a mistress. So he was sobbing and he picked up this book as he heard the young children sing a song and read. And this verse, Romans chapter 13, verse 13 to 14, stand up to him. 
It says, let us walk properly as in the daylight, not in orgies and in drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but in the Lord Jesus Christ, and make no provisions for the flesh to gratify our desires. And because of this one word, this person changed, and literally, God changed church history through him. Do you know that Martin Luther, based on his reading on the book written by this person, he was convicted to start the Protestant Reformation. You know who is this person? One of the great church fathers. You all should know him. You all should spend time reading his book. Out of his repentance, after his conviction of sins, he wrote the number first autobiography of the Western culture. Before then, there was no such thing. Nobody ever write bibliography. When someone write bibliography, it's somebody else write about a famous person. They write about, you know, for example, like Steve Jobs is very famous, and I write about his life story, right? But this person, he wrote the first author bibliography of all times. The title of the book is called Confessions. In Confessions, in the book, he didn't write about his accomplishment. He didn't write about how good he is. He wrote about how sinful he is and how desperately he needs God. This person is Augustine. We all need to remember this person because all of our theologies in terms of redemption, in terms of grace, in terms of how sin entered the world, all of this we build upon the work Augustine, his writing, laid the groundwork for all the ones that comes after him, including Martin Luther, John Calvin, and the others. That include all of us. So he wrote, he, he read from Romans, and he came away a changed person. Now today I want to share with you some of my favorite words from the book of Romans. What is it I'm going to read to you? Maybe I can do it two ways, alright? How many of you like to memorize scripture? Let me see. Not many, I know. I'm not discouraging, don't worry. Okay. <laughs> yes, but it's so important to memorize scriptures. I remember in our early days when we share the gospel, there are four tracks that we want to tell, you know, how a person has sinned, isn't that right? So this is, that's why I can I remember all that. I'm going to read the scripture. This is all from the book of Romans. You can guess what was this, okay? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Do you remember the words? Romans 3. It's very easy. I'm going to remember it. 23. Now, I want you to build on that, alright? Because this is how I memorize it. Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The next one, you're going to memorize. Romans 6, 23. You see, it's, it's, that's how easy to memorize, right? 3, 23 and 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, the words that I share with you, this is the gospel verse. When you talk to an unbeliever, these are the words that you quote. Alright, Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Romans 8, verse 1. We sing, sometimes we sing it in songs, and you might recognize it. There is, and therefore, there is no, there is no what? There is and therefore, there is no free lunch. <laughs> come on, come on, help me out. There is and therefore, there is no condemnation. For those who are in, who? 
Christ Jesus. Amen. Come on, memorize that. Romans 8.1 There is and therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now this is the words I can guarantee you that all of you call it. Alright? Because we all like to call it. When something wrong happens, we call it. What is it? For we know that for those who love God, all things what? Work together for good, right? For those who are called according to His purpose. For we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. This is one of our all-time favorite scriptures because it helped to encourage us in time of trouble that we know that all things, not just good things, but bad things, it can work together for good. For God has His purpose. Amen? Another favorite verse. This is it. That's what I'm telling you from the book of Romans. There's so many words I can share with you. So many. Right? So that one is Romans 8 28. Easy one to get, right? What did I tell you? 3 23, 6 23, right? 8 28, and then 8 38. These are all good words. What is it? For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor power, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to what? To separate us from, from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Isn't it powerful, brother and sister? See, I just read you these few words right away, you're like, ah, oh, you can receive it. It's so stunning the impact of, of, of God's word. It can come alive in you. Amen? It builds you up. There are more to it. <laughs> there are more to it. Remember, this is just the introduction, alright? I'm trying to stir your appetite. One word that convict, uh, uh, give Martin Luther such great convictions to start Protestant Reformation is this verse. Chapter 1, verse 17. For the righteous shall live by Hello? By what? The righteous shall live by faith. Come on, help me out here. Say it one time. The righteous shall live by faith. Amen. Not by works, but by faith. All the world religions, there is a system, a merit system for you to earn your own deliverance or salvation or nirvana or how you name it. But it is only in Christianity that we are saved by our, our faith in Christ Jesus. Amen, brother and sister. It is so important. Last week, some of you are not here, some of you are away, or some uh, are at the retreat. I talked about how important it is for us to recognize our identities, that is, in Christ, who we are really. Now, I'm going to end, I'm going to invite our worship team to come forward. I'm going to share with you uh, what I shared last week. Worship team. Romans chapter 8, verse 19 to 24. Alright, it's a long verse. So pay attention to this. How about let's read together, okay? On the count of three. One, two, three. For the creation wills with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in pain of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoptions as sons, the redemptions of our bodies. For in this hope, we will save. Oh, it's a long verse. What does it say? It tells
tell us the harsh realities that we live in. What is this reality? The reality is everything that you touch and see in this physical world is passing away. I know it can be a hard pill to swallow, especially for young people that you have full of dreams and ambition. It is good to have dreams and ambition because God wants to use our dreams and ambition. Amen, brothers and sisters. However, at the back of all that, you need to first set your priority right. Because in this world that we live in, this is only our temporary place. But God has a high purpose for us. That whatever God calls you to be, you will use that as a channel, as a means to do what? To share the good news. And what is that good news? It's more than just Jesus died on the cross for our sins and that we have eternal life. You see, a lot of Christians, they only enter the gate and then they think that they are done. They say, I'm safe. No. Finish. Finita. Do I say it right? Because my kids are going to learn Spanish now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't know why it comes up, but finish. Right? But then the reality is that no, it is not because God has so much more to reveal to us. God doesn't just want us to be saved. God wants us to grow up. Your true identity in Christ is we are co-heirs. We are children of God. We are sons and daughters of God. Amen, brother and sister. I'm going to read you the scriptures from the same book of Romans chapter 8. For you, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons. And by whom we cry, Abba Fathers. We have a God, and more than that, we have a Father God in heaven that loves us and is calling us to grow into maturity, to grow into a position where He knows what is the purpose of our lives. The purpose of our life is never about accumulation of wealth and things and assets. You can keep on buying and buying and buying. At the end of the day, all your buying and accumulating will not give you joy and satisfaction. Will not give you peace that surpasses all understanding. I can tell you this, brother and sister, a lot of rich people, they cannot sleep at night. They spend sleepless nights worrying and being anxious about how to maintain and how to keep the things. This is the, not the life that God has purpose for you. Your purpose in life is not to become famous so that everybody on the social media tag you, hashtag you, or whatever that term that they use nowadays. How many followers you are? How, what, you know, you are influencer or something, you know? It's fine, you're making money off it. I'm talking with the meaning and some of you might not get it, right? But what I'm saying that popularities and fame, all these things will go, will come and go away. Nothing lasts in this world. But only the love of God. And God is waiting for us to grow into this status that you are a son and daughters, that you know the call of a Father God. And what is it? I'm going to end this with the first verse in the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 1. You see, the Apostle Paul, he know it very clearly. What is God's call in his life? And this is how he introduced himself. He said, Paul, 
a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. The three things that he's very clear of. Number one, that he's a servant of God. Of course, at the end of the day, at the bottom of our hearts, we are all children of God. But you're going to grow into a role. A mature sons and daughters, you will know that you will be a servant of God. Because Jesus Christ himself came not to be served, but to serve any brothers and sisters. So this is Paul. He knows his calling. He's a servant of God. What is his position? He said, Paul to be an apostle. Apostle is someone that's going around encouraging church plantings, encouraging church growth movement. That might not be your call, which is fine. But all of us have a call in our life. When you look at church, the important of the fivefold ministry, what are they? Apostles, prophets, right? Teachers, pastors, evangelists. Some of you are called to evangelize. You, you might not need to go to a third world country to evangelize. No. You may be God called you to evangelize simply to your neighbors. How do you know that? Maybe you are so good at making cookies. You know what? Instead of enjoying your cookie yourself, bring the cookies to your neighbors. Right? Start the conversation. Get the conversation rolling. Some of you can't call you to the teachers. That's why you study the words of God. Right? That's why when I ask, show me your hand if some of you memorize your words. Some, for those of you that do not memorize the words, maybe teaching is not your thing. Alright? Because that is like one of the very, very important skills you need when you are a teacher and you memorize things. Which is fine if it's not your call. But of course, you know, for Christian growth, memorizing scripture is very important. For me personally, I see myself no matter you know what I'm doing now professionally, I'm a business owner, but I always know that God has called me to be a pastor, to be a shepherd, to help, to, to work in whatever capacity, to help to nurture the spiritual life of the flocks. And here I am today. But what about you? What has God called you? You need to read the book of Romans and you need to ask yourself these questions and make a decision, make a life changing decision and do something about it. Amen, brothers and sisters. And number three, Paul is very clearly, he knows that his life mission is for the gospel. That he will live a life that is set apart. That is the meaning of being called to be holy, to set apart for what? For God's purpose. And here we are, brothers and sisters. I want to encourage you. Take this to your heart. Take this challenge to your heart and ask yourself these honest questions. You can be a housewife, you can be a banker, you can be an accountant, you can be a doctor, you can be a lawyer, you can be a student, whatever position that you are, I'm here to tell you God has a call in your life. Amen, brother and sister. Let's stand together. God is good. Let's sing a song together. Let's sing a song together and let the words of God dwell and grow in our hearts. And God will cast out all our insecurity and fear. And God will come us to me. Be the king. Be the king of my heart. Be the mountain where I run. The mountains I dream of. Oh, yes, my song. The kings of my heart. Be the shadow where I run. The lands 